Okay, so um, <coughs> auto vectorizing compilers. So, so far we've seen that we can get some speed up, we can get the compiler to tell us what it's been doing. Um, <coughs> but um, there are some limits to auto vectorization. You've seen one, uh, certain loops with dependencies and so on. So, we're going to look at a few instances where the compiler has a problem. And some of you have seen some of these already by just playing around with little with the little codes yourself. So such simple codes as these, it's very good because you don't have to follow uh, the, the instructions here. You can play with things yourself and discover things yourself that are, that are perhaps in some ways even more interesting than what I'm trying to get across. So <coughs> one of the things we're going to look at, uh, some people have already just looked at, is uh, the idea of non-contiguous data, particularly on these big core processes that we have with SSC and AVX instructions. Um, We'll also have a look at the inability to distinguish aliased data. Um, that is data that could be referring to the sa same data. Two pointers, for example, pass through. This should really be a problem in Fortran because Fortran bans you, for example, from passing the same uh, array in as two dummy arguments into a subroutine. People still do it, <laughs> but it's breaking the, uh, the convention. So a compiler does have the liberty to make extra, have for extra freedoms there. Um, <coughs> And then we're going to look at uh, one case, just one case of vector dependencies. Now, vector dependencies, as you've already seen, there's a huge class of them. Um, but some of them are actually real that you really can't do much about. But many of them are ones where the compiler thinks there's a dependency or sees a dependency. And it's, it's written in front of it as a dependency, but there's a way of rewriting exactly the same piece of code that the compiler then sees it differently. Or, alternatively, the compiler might think there's a possibility of a dependency, but you know better and you can tell the compiler, no, actually, we're going to be fine. Now here, as I said at the beginning, this is a very simple example. All we're looking at is this simple copy, this simple copy and update, sorry. Um, so we're only considering 1D. Things can get much more difficult with multiple dimensions, and that's where getting some feedback from the compiler can be very important. <coughs> now, there are some in inhibitors we won't actually look at here as well. Uh, sometimes conditional statements in loops can cause problems for a vectorizing compiler, um, although sometimes it might be able to actually help out with the vectorization. It may be able to hoist things out of the loop or find some ways of making predicated instructions um, and some reduction operations. And then there are some architecture-specific vectorization inhibitors that we don't have to worry about with the codes, particularly the Intel um, uh, processes that we're looking at here. Um, to do with, for example, alignment of data. But this could become an issue on other architectures, for example, perhaps on a blue gene queue or so on. Sometimes to get the best performance, you have to have certain alignments. So, the first of those then, back into practical again. And now we're going to look at a very simple example of non-contiguous data. And this is just to say, this is not a thing that necessarily is going to be generally applicable to vector processes overall, and in the past it wasn't. And I don't know if it will be a problem on the mic, but we can wait until tomorrow and the next day to find out whether that's true or not. But certainly on the standard SSE AVX instructions, this is an inhibitor. So, please. Okay, so the compiler report tells you that it can or can't compile by default. So the first, the original code. Can it tell you anything? It's possible but inefficient. Okay, so it's, it's non-contiguous data. It didn't probably tell you that, but it is non-contiguous data. Um, and so therefore, it might be able to vectorize it, but it might have to copy it before it can vectorize it. And so therefore, it wouldn't do it. Now you can force it to, which we'll look at in a second, but, um, but it's often, if the compiler's telling you that, you might want to listen. Um, but you might want to try the alternative anyway, just in case. Um, but if you remove the update to B, what happens then? Then it's vectorized. How is it vectorizing it if it's got non-contiguous data but it couldn't before? Does it say something else on the report? Does it just say loop was vectorized? Or does it say... Sorry? permuted loop was vectorized. So it finds a way of actually making it so that it's 
And actually, how fast is it as well, is another question. Because it might find a way of twisting data around. It might also find a way of saying, well, actually, I think you're just doing this operation over and over and over again. And I can therefore do some twisting around of the loops. But the fact that there's a B update in the middle means that it can't know. The reason we had it in there was simply to stop it from doing that. It can't know that it can do a certain transformation if it sees B being updated as well. Once B is updated and B is now a constant for the loops, it could do something else. So non-contiguous data causes us a problem. Okay? So if you are doing a finite difference scheme with a red-black sweep, for example, jumping across uh, different places, not using the contiguous data, that could cause you a problem. You'd have to find some way of getting around that with some other data structure, some other copies. And so in particular, the instructions such as SSE and ABX can only vectorize on contiguous blocks of data. There's no gather-scatter uh, capabilities such as some older vector architectures had. Um, even if you have such a thing where it can say, okay, I can vectorize and I can spread out and take these entries that are not together, particularly if they're regularly spaced, you've still just got to just work out that you will actually lose on memory bandwidth because it's a cache-based architecture. It would load in a cache line. But that may be something you're willing to suffer if you can get the vectorization. So to get the vectorization, you normally have to do a data copy and decide if it's worthwhile. And as you've seen, the compiler will often tell you, I think I could do this on your behalf, but I don't think it's very profitable. So the next one, next practical, the next uh, issue that we can see, and this one is, it's now a C-only code. Fortran programmers, I'm afraid, are going to have to step into the C world for a second. We're looking at um, overlapping data possibilities, aliasing. This is something that um, we therefore are going to have a look at it in, in one case, which is just in one file. And we're not doing any cross-file into procedural op optimization on the compiler flags we have. So in one file, and then also in, by compiling it in two separate files and getting those linked together, see if there's any differences, see what the vectorization reports say. And then we're going to look at something else. Okay? And this is another very nice feature of that Intel compiler is that um, <coughs> as well as getting a vectorization report, you can also ask it, um, can you give me some help? Okay, you told me there's a problem. Is there any way I can fix it? And so the minus guide flag will actually, in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, many cases, it might actually be able to say, well, look, if you did this, I'll vectorize for you. Okay, so then you could try and implement that advice and see if we get any difference, difference in the timings.